All right, so listen, there are some stories in the Bible that, uh, that we tend to be familiar with, that, that, that tend to be talked about, taught on, uh, they show up really often. They're, they're stories that if you're like me and you grew up going to church, you, you've heard these stories from the time you were a small child all the way up until now, and, 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 and honestly, even if you haven't heard some of these stories, you you, you maybe read them from the Bible, you've heard about them, right? They're stories that, that we're familiar with, the stories that we know. And, and here's the problem, is that sometimes we get really familiar with stories, some of the stories in the Bible, so familiar that, um, that we just read right past them, right? Like we read them and we think, I know that story. Have you, I mean, have you ever heard, have you ever thought that in your mind? Like the pastor will get up or you'll be in a small group or you'll be with someone who will bring up a story and you go, I know that when I know how it starts, I know what's going to happen. I know everything. I know how it's going to end. I know the main point even. And so we, we tend to sort of just scoot on right past it because we know that. This morning we're going to look at one of those stories and it's a really familiar story. In fact, it's a story it's so familiar that that it even shows up in in in, in our in our pop and modern culture. It's the story of the prodigal son. It's the story of this son who thought he knew better. He left home and and goes off on his own, ruins his life, and then realizes that wait a minute, my life was better back with my family, and so he returns to his family. It, in, in fact, it's so common. It's, it's one of the, the reasons I think that we love you know the comeback story, right? And think about how many movies have this theme in. It's Stan Lee, that who uh, you know, sort of somewhat famous for his comics that he he wrote and developed, said that Iron Man was inspired by the prodigal son, this young guy who had all this money and was wasting his life until he found a greater purpose. The writer of The Godfather, all right, you stay with me here, because he even said that it was inspired by the prodigal son of Michael, who left and went to the army and came back and found a found his found out that really what he wanted in life was with his family all along, even though his family was evil. Uh, they're not, not really good, but that's what he was inspired by that, right? This idea of someone leaving something that's good, thinking they can find something better, and then returning back to the, the thing that they had all along. So we're going to look at this story, the story of, of the prodigal son, the story of a kid who thinks he knows better, who leaves home and, and ends up messing his life. It's a story that begins with a son leaving home and losing everything. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15, and let's just start reading in verse 11, and this is Jesus talking, and it says, and he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me, and he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had sent everything, spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the paws that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything." So let's stop here and just talk about this. I, I think about what an insult this must have been for the father when the son comes to him and says, hey, dad, you're not dying fast enough. Um, I want my inheritance now. I mean, that's what it is, right? Your inheritance is what you get after your parents pass away. And it's like, you can see it, right? You can imagine this young man coming to his father and saying, father, I, you know what? I'm not getting any younger, and I want to be able to enjoy my inheritance while I'm still young and can do things. I don't want to wait until I'm old like you are to enjoy life. And so would you just go ahead, since you're not dying, would you just go ahead and give me my money now? Now, I've warned my children, do not try this at home, all right? Uh, one, I don't have anything to give them because I've, like, given everything I have, so there's nothing. And two, I might smack you. I'm just going to tell you straight up, it's just not, that's not good. I know it's not politically correct, but it's like, it's rude. It's really rude what the dad, what the son is saying to his father. Father, give me my inheritance now. And yet the father does it. And so he takes all his stuff, and he's the younger son, so he's going to get basically the equivalent of one-third. The, the older son would get a double portion, and he was responsible for the family. So he gets his portion, and he gathers it all up, and, and then he leaves. 
And he goes to a large city, and, and in this large city, he begins to, in his mind, make a life for himself, but he's, as the Bible says, reckless. Um, you get the idea that he's just sort of spreading his money around, and, and, and people are liking him. Why? Because he's got money, and he's willing to share it, and buy, you know, pay for drinks at the bar, and, and have all the party, and buy all the cool new toys, and do all the fun stuff. And so everyone is, is really liking him until he begins to run out of money. And then not only does he run out of money, but a famine hits the land, and, and he finds himself with nothing. In fact, the only job that he can find is a job working for a guy taking care of pigs. Have you ever seen pigs? I'm not talking about the cute little pink pigs on the internet. I'm talking about the kind of pigs that are big and stinky and live in mud, the kind of pigs that eat pig slop, right? That's what we call it. Those are the pigs that he's taking care of. In fact, he's so hungry that he looks at the pig slop and goes, you know what, that's not that bad. That's not that bad. I, I could eat that. But no one would even give him pig slop to eat. It's not a pretty picture, is it? It doesn't sound like the life that when I was a kid I grew up, man, I hope one day I lose everything and go feed pigs, right? That's what I want to do. I want to live in the pig pen with the pigs and feed the pigs. But that's where he finds himself. And it's not just, listen, the, 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 those that were listening to this story for the first time, what was shocking was not just that he was living in this, in this dirty, disgusting place wanting to eat this nasty food. What was shocking to the people listening was that pigs were considered unclean in the Hebrew world, right? That's why they don't eat bacon today. And I'm sorry, I'm glad God, you know, allows us to now eat bacon, but they couldn't even touch a pig. And if they touched a pig, they became unclean. And if they were unclean until they went through the process of cleansing, the ceremonial process of being cleansed, they could not be around, touch, interact with another Hebrew. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even do it. They would see him on, the, on one side of the street and they would cross over to the other side because they didn't want to touch the guy because he was unclean because he had been with unclean animals. In addition to that, he could not go into the temple or the synagogue so he could not even worship God. He was cut off from people. He was cut off from God. He was all alone. For, for a Hebrew man or woman, this was about as... As, as low as you could possibly go, and that is where this young man found himself. And why? Why was he here? He was here because he believed a lie that, that, that is so prevalent in our world today that the moment I tell you, you're going to say, that doesn't sound so bad. And the lie that he believed... The lie that he believed that led him to this pig pen, the lie that I think so many people believe in our world that leads us to the same level of, of aloneness, of separation from people and God, and the lie is this, just follow your heart. Just do what feels good. I mean, do, it, do what's right for you. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever seen that? Someone gave us a, a, a banner, and Emily just put it up, and I'm like, you got to take that down because I'm preaching on it. Like this week, and it said, just follow your heart. Here's what the problem is. It sounds good, doesn't it, right? And I hear people tell that to their children, and I hear people sort of say, I'm just doing what feels right to me. I mean, you only live once, so you might as well spend it all and do it all now. The problem is that the Bible tells us our heart is deceitful, and it lies to us. And we don't just live once, we live for all of eternity. And the choices and the things that we do now have eternal consequences to them. And so this young man, this young man who, who, who looks at it and goes, Dad, I, I want to live life on my own. I want to do what's, what's right for me. Ask his dad and he gives him everything. And then he ruins it and blows it and wastes his life. You know what, it's no different then, and, and I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. I, I, I went to, a, officiated a funeral not long ago, and, and burying this man who was incredibly wealthy, I mean like incredibly wealthy, successful in, in terms and ways that, 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 that as high as this world can imagine ever being, and none of his family even loved him. 
because he spent all of his time pursuing his dream of being successful. And he achieved great success, but in the process, he ignored and abandoned his family. And he didn't divorce him. He just didn't pay any attention to him. And they all hated his guts. And it was one of the hardest funerals I ever had to do because he followed his dream of achieving and he lost everything. You see it in the attic who, 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 who just wants one more moment of pleasure. Just one more, take away the pain, make me feel good. And so, hey, I'm going to take one more hit or one more drink or watch one more whatever it is that you're watching. And you, you do one more thing and you end up pushing all the people that love you away. I think of the, the spouse who just says, you know what? I really like the attention that that person gives me. I like the way they talk to me and the way they, they, they treat me. And it's so much better than my husband or wife at home. And so they pursue that other relationship and end up ruining their marriage and their family in the process. I'm telling you, and I tell my kids this all the time, don't follow your heart, follow Jesus. Don't follow your heart, follow Jesus. And, and here's why. Because the plans that Jesus has for you are far superior to anything you could come up with on your own. Right? The, the things that Jesus wants for you, the life that he has for you, the friendships, the relationships, the whatever it is, those things that he has for you are far better, far superior than anything you could ever want for yourself. Whatever you think is going to make your life great, Jesus says, I've got far better for, that, for you than that. But too often we say, I'm going to do what, what I want to do, what feels right to me. What I think I should do. And Jesus says, listen, don't follow your heart. Follow Him. And I think this morning there may be some of us who need to, to take a moment. Listen, to take a moment to, to look up and see where you really are in life. I mean, let, can we just maybe for just, just a moment this morning be really honest about where we are in our lives about what it is that we're pursuing, what it is that we're going after, what it is that we want. I mean, do we want to be close to our Father where we listen to Him and we follow Him and we trust Him and we believe that what He wants is better for us than anything that this world has to offer? Is that the life that we're living? I'm not talking about do we feel it. I'm not talking about do we see it. I'm not talking about do we understand it. I'm saying do we trust our Father to stay close to Him? Some of us need, maybe need to realize that we're moving away from our Father. Not, not necessarily in big steps the way like this young man did, but, but maybe in little ways. Maybe we're just beginning to ignore Him and not pay attention and, and say, God, I know what you say, but, but here's what I want and here's what I think and here's what I want to do. And we're, and we're beginning to move away from our Father. Can I tell you that when we start moving away from Him, it always ends in the pig pen. It's where it always ends. And maybe that's where some of us find ourselves this morning that, that we feel cut off from people and we feel cut off from God and, and we've made just really bad decisions and we're not even sure that we know how to get back. Because if that's where you are, there's really good news because the story does not end with, with this young man in the pig pen. Look at verse 17 and it talks about that he comes to the place where, where he realizes that redemption is found with his father. It says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. 
For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. I, I, I love that moment when he realizes that, that, that living with the pigs isn't fun. Right? And, and I think that when we find ourselves far from God, separated from Him, when we look up and realize, you know what I'm doing? I am not doing nothing but messing up my life and the plan that God has for me. We really have two choices. We can either stay and learn to love the mud, learn to love the pig pen, or we can make the choice to return home and find forgiveness and redemption with Jesus. There are so many people, so many of us that spend so much time separated from God, so much time in the pigs, with the pigs, so much time so far from God that that we begin to get used to it. We begin to think, hey, that's what life is supposed to be. I mean, we complain about it. We don't like it. We know that it stinks, literally and figuratively. Like We know that it's not what we want, and we, we may even try to clean up our lives. We may even try to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix a few things. I'm going to make a few little changes, but we don't return to God. And so the problem with trying to clean up the pig pen is that it always has pigs in it. So you can shovel as much as you want to shovel. And you can rearrange everything to get it just right. And you can even decorate the pig pen. But you know what's going to happen when, that, when you decorate the pig pen and you clean it up? The next day it's going to look just like it was before. Why? Because it's filled with pigs. It's filled with things that keep us from our great and loving Heavenly Father. And so we can either stay there and complain about it and try to fix it up a little bit, or we can stop trying to clean up a pig pen and go home. Go home to our Father who loves us. Go home to our Father who who always wants the best for us. Go all in with Jesus because what He wants for you is far better than even what you want for yourself. You know, we see another um, tension, another common philosophy that we have in our world today sort of playing itself out here, and it's the it's not my fault philosophy. The, the idea that, that, that the reason I'm here, the circumstances that I'm facing, the challenges that I have going on, it can't be my fault. It has to be someone else's fault. And I think this son could have easily said, you know what, it's not my fault that I'm living with the pigs. I mean, it's, you know, I went to, I had great plans when I left home. I planned to make great money and do all these amazing investments. I planned to be successful. I was going to show my dad that I could make it on my own. And everything was going well until like you know the economy went bad and my investment sank until I realized that the friends that I thought I had it's their fault because you know I mean they abandoned me they only wanted that so they weren't good people and if they had been better people then things would have worked out better it's a it, it could have been the kind of thing where he says you know my, my father had just prepared me better for what was going on I wouldn't be in this situation I I wouldn't be in this circumstance that could have easily said it's not my fault but that's not what he said what did he say I blew it I walked away from my father I stopped listening to him I thought I knew better than what than what he knew did said once there are things that happen in our lives that are beyond our control. I think some of you, I know, lost your house in a fire a few years ago when a lot of people here did, and you didn't do anything wrong, and it wasn't like you know, some, you'd done something bad, and that's why your house burnt in those fires. There was just a drought and a fire, and you lost everything. And So there are things that are happened beyond our control, but, but let's just be honest that most of our circumstances... Most of where we find ourselves are the result of our choices, of our decisions, of the things that we say that we want to do or not do, of listening to God or not listening to God. Because I'm here to tell you, you may walk away from God, but He never leaves you. So if you find yourself far from Him, it's not that God left you, you left Him. 
And sometimes, in, especially in this world where, where we can always find someone else to blame, we might need to take a moment, look in the mirror, and just say, you know what, God, I messed up. I, I play this little game sometime with my kids, and they don't like it, but I don't care because I'm a dad and they can get over themselves. And it's the what's my part in it game. Right? The, the, something doesn't go right. Something doesn't work out the way they plan. It's the question of, well, what part did you play in that? I didn't play any part. Well, yes, you did, so just let's think about it. No, I didn't. It's all their fault. No, it's not all their fault. What part did you play? Now, I love to do it with them. They don't like it when they do it back with me, but, but, but you know, that's not fair because I'm the dad. And you're not supposed to you know, do my own stuff against me. But, but I started thinking, not, just like, what if we started asking that question in our lives? Tell you a funny way it played out. The other day I was meeting someone for coffee, and they, they tend to be late, but I tend to be pretty nice. And so I'm like, hey, let's meet. They, ask, they call me up, can we meet? I go, yeah, what time? I go, hey, on this day, let's, let's do one o'clock. Will that work? Yeah, one o'clock. Uh, uh, one ish, I said, something, you know, that's not no big deal, just one ish. And, and, and I get to the coffee shop at one. And, um, and I'm getting a little upset because it's like at 1.15 they haven't shown up. And I'm mad because like they're always late and it's always their fault. And I got something to do out here. So now I'm going to be late to my next thing because they're late to this thing. And then I, I, I remembered what I said. Because you know what I didn't say? Hey, I got something I got to do about 2.15. So I need to leave it too. Can we do it at 1? Because if we can't do it at 1, then, then let's find another time where we have a little more flexibility. Because I got, I got a pretty packed day that day. And I was getting mad at them because they were doing what I asked them to do. Just show up at 1-ish. Just whenever. It's no big deal. And I think about how often I get mad and upset at things that are simple and small or big or whatever. And how many times the truth is it's my fault, my choices, my decisions. And maybe we need to, to back up and go, you know what? I am where I am because of the choices that I've made. And so God, I'm going to make the choice right now to return to you. Because there's always a choice we have and always have the option to return to him. Can I say that? You always have the option to return to Jesus. And some of us maybe need to, this morning, take a moment and, and just turn around and come home. Come back to Him. Return to Him. Say, God, you know what? I've made some just dumb, foolish choices and I'm ready to come home. Because the cool part about this story to me, the, the best part is that when he's coming home, what does the father do? He doesn't see his son off in the distance and say, well, I'm going to let him think about it the whole way walking here. I'm going to sit on the rocking chair and I hope he knows how bad he messed up. He doesn't sort of figure out a punishment to do to teach him a lesson because I'm going to show him how bad he messed up, how rude he was to me. No, the minute he sees his son in a distance, he runs to him. And you know the son had a speech all prepared, right? I mean, he talks about it. Right? I'm going to go to my dad, and I'm going to say, Dad, I sinned against you, and I sinned against heaven. Um, I'm not worthy to even be your son. Hey, can I, can I just have a job, anything? I'd prefer not to do pigs, but anything else, can I just have a job? Because I know that you at least take care of the people that work for you. Is there any way you could put me to work? And he starts his little speech, right? You ever rehearsed a speech when you messed up and you're trying to fix things? And he starts his little speech and he says, Hey, Dad, I've messed up and his dad says, Stop. I've been waiting for you to come home. Stop. I know you messed up. You know you messed up. We all know you messed up. But you're home. And he turns around to his servants and he says, Guys, he stinks. Can you get him some clean clothes? Guys, he doesn't look like the son of a wealthy man. Would you put some rings on him? He, he hadn't eaten in a while. Let's don't give him some leftovers. Can you go kill a fatted calf? The best, the best meat that we have. Can we just do a barbecue and we're going to have a big party? Because my son that was gone, my son that was dead, my son that left has come home. Dads, what would you do if you're if your kid was lost, I mean, how far would you go to get him back? 
What extreme would you be willing, would you be willing to, to die to get them back? That's what God was willing to do for you. He sent His Son to die to pay for our sins so that no matter how much we mess up, we can always come home. We can always find forgiveness. We can always find hope and life and freedom. And so today, if you find yourself moving away from, or if you find yourself far from God, if you're just going to take a moment and be honest and say, you know what, I know what God is saying. I know what God wants. I know what God desires. But the truth is, I am far from Him. I'm here to tell you today that Jesus is welcoming you home. Just stop, turn around, And come to Him. Listen to Him. Follow Him. Trust Him that that He knows what He's doing and He always, always, always wants the best for you. I don't know where you are today. We're somewhere all on this spectrum, aren't we? We're either really, really close to God, listening, following Him, or we're really, really far from God and living with the pigs. But most of us are honestly somewhere in between, aren't we? And we're either, the truth is, either moving away from Him or moving toward Him. And so what that means is that, that each of us, we, we really are in one of two, we need one of two things. We need to consider one of two things for our life. We either need to ask for help or we need to help, or we need to, excuse me, offer help. And here's what I mean. Maybe you're here today and you would say, you know what, Stephen? I am far from God and I'm moving further from God. Maybe today is the day you just need to ask for help. Ask for help from God, but maybe ask for help from the person sitting next to you. Or maybe ask for help from one of our group leaders. Maybe ask for help from just someone that you've met who seems like they're at least trying to follow God. You know what the beauty of the church is? The church is not just about people who, who pretend like they have it all together and we come together to show how much we have it all together. No, the beauty of the church is that we are here to help each other. And I'm telling you, whatever it is that you're struggling with, wherever it is that you've been, whatever journey you're on, there are people here who would love to say, I will walk with you hand in hand right back to Jesus. Challenge me. Throw something out at me. I'll find 10 people that have been through and been where you are and would love to help you. So maybe today, some of us, some of us need to just say, I need help. Going back to Jesus. Because He's waiting for you. He's looking for you. He's longing for you. You don't have to keep moving away from Him. But there's another side to this. And we don't have time to read the rest of the story. But if you know the story, you know that the big brother was not happy with Dad, was he? And he wasn't happy with Dad because he goes to Dad and he says, Dad, what are you doing? Why are you throwing a party for this loser? Like, look, it's in there. It doesn't say loser, but it's the same thing, right? Why are you th- Do you know what he did, Dad? Don't you remember when he came to you and said, I wish you were dead, can I have all your money? Don't you remember how he gathered all the, all the stuff that you had and he just blew it being foolish and stupid and all of the dumb choices that he made? Dad, why are you, why are you even talking to him? I, your older son, have done everything right. I've been faithful, I've worked hard, I've, you've never thrown a party for me, and I'm the good kid. I've got a younger sister, we are, I am 48, she's 46, and we still argue over who's the better kid, and she can be wrong all she wants, because I know the truth, that it's me, and that's the, that's the thing going on here, right? I'm the good kid, you're the bad kid, why are you paying attention to the bad kid, Dad? And he was angry, and he was upset. And look at what the dad says in, in verse 31. He says, and, and he, the, the dad, said to him, the older son, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. Just listen. A, a faithful life to God is never a wasted life. Hear me? If your story is that I've tried to be faithful to God, and somehow you think that's not a good life, or you've wasted something... A life that is faithful to your father is never a wasted life. 32, though. 
It is fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Our Father loves when His kids come home. Our Father celebrates when His kids come home. So what are you doing to help people come home? Are you more concerned about their mistakes and what they've done? And, oh man, they're, they're, they've messed up. Oh, they're broken. Oh, look at all of their failures and faults and sins and all of the brokenness in their life. Is that what we're concerned about? Or are we, do we share the heart of our Father, the heart that says, you know what? They were dead and now they are alive. They, are lo- they were lost and now they are found. What can I do to help one more person find life in Jesus? We've been going through the the book of Luke, dropping in at various passages and looking at what does it mean to follow Jesus. Well, I'm telling you, if we're going to follow Jesus, that means we're going to be close to our Father. We're going to pursue Him. And then when we mess up, we're going to come back to Him. But it also means that we're going to do everything we can to help one more person find life, no matter how much they've messed up. And my prayer for Calvary is that we're the place that when you mess up, you can come because we're going to walk right with you back to Jesus. We're going to love you. We're going to help. We're going to encourage. We're going to lift up. Because following Jesus says that we do and we welcome and we run to the people that are hurting and broken in this world. So who is hurting and broken in your life that you need to love right back into God's kingdom? If you're far from him, come home. If you're close, help others come home. And that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for being a truly great God. The God-